Hi, everyone. We're back. Hi, guys. Come on in. We are ready to talk about natural hair this evening. Come on in. I'm just waiting and ready for everyone to come on in. Hi, Renee. Renee is coming in from Trinidad. Hi. Come on in. I want to see everybody come on in. Get yourself comfortable. Make yourself a cup of tea. Sit down and relax. We're going to talk about an hour or two regarding natural hair and traveling with natural hair. And we have a special guest with us today. So I just want you guys to come on in, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your colleagues that we are live on Happy Teachers Online Club. Share this video with your friends. Let everybody know that we are here and we're waiting for everyone to join on. All right, so welcome everyone. Welcome to, that, to tonight's live event. And we have a special guest today. Her name is Tawanda Basin. And we are going to be talking to her later on about natural hair and all things concerning traveling with natural hair and cultural issues around our natural hair. Our natural hair. But before we do that, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Venice Irving. And I am the CEO of Happy Teachers. And you have been a part of the, the Happy Teachers journey with me. You know that Happy Teachers is an, an online tutorial company and we're also a cross-cultural communications company. We train teachers, we place teachers, we introduce teachers to the earning second income in, in US dollars. We also help to bridge that gap with you know, just introducing teachers to the culture, the different cultures around the world, um, training them about that, and doing workshops about not only culture but about, uh, but also on <laughs> second income earnings online. All right. So I'm so happy that you can be here. I want you to share right now. Go onto your social media, share this page, put hashtag happy teachers, hashtag Tawanda Basin. All right, so put on your hashtags, people, and let us get this going. So our guest speaker today is Tawanda Basin. Hello. And I'm about her. She is a border-breaking specialist. She provides consultation to individuals and organizations struggling with issues related to life abroad, English language learning, and foreign teacher recruitment. She's a native of Mobile, Alabama. She once had a dream of traveling the world, which became a reality in 2009 when she left the USA to teach English in Korea. Since then, she's lived, worked, and vacationed in several countries in Asia, South America, and Africa. With her location, independent business, she's been able to continue her travels around the world, helping others achieve their dreams and goals globally. So I want you to connect with her. Her social media pages is basically at Tawanda Basin, and you can just go on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. It's the same handle. It is at Tawanda Basin. She is a byproduct of her travels. She has spent more than 10 years just being an educator and traveling around. She's been to Korea, South Saudi Arabia, Peru, China, and she's actually helped about 7,000 students online. And her background is in psychology and technology. All right, so welcome Tawanda to our program today. I'm happy that you can join us. I'm happy that you can share with us your expertise. And um, I, I know you're gonna share with us some experience you've had abroad, but you know the meat of the matter that we're gonna talk about today. It's all about natural hair, all right? So welcome to Wanda. Thank you so, for having me. <laughs> so before we start with the questions, I want everyone that's listening to, to make sure that you write your questions below. So while we're talking, if there's any question that pops up in your head that you'd like to ask, just put that in the comment box below. We'll get to your questions at the end of our interview. All right? So Tawanda, where are you now? Yes. yes. Now, 
I'm in Danang, Vietnam, which is an essential part of Vietnam. Okay, so you're in Vietnam. Hmm. So tell me, what are your experiences regarding natural hair while traveling? Um, I have quite a, quite a few. Most of them have been very positive. In every place that I've been, people are quite um, curious. Uh, about uh, our hair, well, my hair since I'm the one that's there, but I'm curious of all of our hair. Um, and I our hair all right so what are some of the responses that you've gotten while traveling with your natural hair yes uh, mostly people are in awe they're very intrigued by it they want to ask how how do you get it like that because they do not understand um, our, our hair type uh, so many people are in admiration they say Oh, beautiful, fashionable. Uh, most of it, again, is like love for it. And they're amazed by the different hairstyles. And you do get people that touch it, um, especially in Southeast Asia um, and East Asia. Like you go to China, <laughs> you'll probably end up with some hands, some hands in your head. Uh, however, I had a similar thing in America. When I went natural as well, because we as we were as natural in the places where I was um, back home. All right. So, have you ever experienced discrimination because of your natural hair? Um, in some ways, I think you may not necessarily know um, if you're being discriminated against, like if someone doesn't respond respond to you like if you send in your resume or your cv however i do remember um when i first um applied to teach abroad and actually i was getting my tefl certification with an organization which was working uh with a couple of recruiters um and one of the recruiters uh he wouldn't really meet when we were supposed to meet and i would end up trying to contact him and i was like okay what's going on and so one day after several times of setting setting meetings um i think he called me back and when he uh when he talked i kind of realized that maybe he had something um uh, maybe discriminatory in mind <laughs> when he spoke because he said the word ethnocentric and he was saying, you know, when when I go to or when we go over to Korea, we're going abroad, we can't be ethnocentric. And so one of the things I uh, he was a he was a white male from America. <laughs> so this is coming from him, not from an actual person in, in Korea, which I had talked to people in Korea before I went there. They seemed very positive and liked my hair when they saw the pictures. But that was one particular um, case because I sent in a picture of myself with my hair just back um, in a ponytail. And then my other picture was my passport where I had a big afro. So I <laughs> believe that may have been like a reason uh, why, why he said that. So that was a particular uh, reason. Yeah, or instance, I, I can think of. And then one other time, I'm not sure if it was uh, about my hair just uh, particularly, but I was actually told by a recruiter uh, that I spoke to in China uh, by phone. He was saying that at the time, black people, it wasn't a trend. <laughs> Pretty much, it was like, sometimes people's choice of words, it wasn't a trend at that, mo at that time. However, I guess African American um, teachers are black teachers, and uh, <laughs> so this is what he was saying. He he said it's kind of like hidden. They won't tell. They won't tell you that. But that was his reason as to why he was saying um, the salary that I was looking for 
because I was like, okay, I'm not a you know a new teacher. So I was looking for something higher and he was trying to get me to accept something something lower because he was basically saying because African Americans weren't the trend among <laughs> among I guess like the schools at that time that it would be difficult for him to try to get me a position. But I didn't I didn't really listen to him because I I know otherwise. <laughs> Um, that was in 2015. Yeah, 2015. Okay. All right. So yes. based on that response that you've gotten from employers or recruiters, would you say that they ha are more educated now about African-Americans or Black people going and traveling abroad, um, especially with you know, us as Black females with natural hair? Do you think they're more educated or do you think there's still um, there's still a lack of information coming from that side? Um, definitely there's still a lack of information because I think it has to do with uh, people individually and a lot has to do with media. And also when you're dealing with um, private schools versus public schools, I think maybe in public schools, it may be... Um, Maybe somewhat better was in private schools are depending upon the money that they get from their clients. So a lot of times that can be influenced by media as to what their clients are looking for, uh, because many people, as far as like media goes, the type of media that they get, <laughs> and I've observed these things with them in other countries. Um, you know, they can kind of control what gets out there or whatever comes from the U.S. I don't know how. Um, they can control that, but I've seen the images that people are seeing in other countries. And so, for example, in Korea, I don't watch TV that um, that often. Really, I don't watch it that much unless I'm with someone else who has the TV on. But when I had the TV on before in Korea, um, you see things like Tupac <laughs> hanging around, and um, uh, who was that? Flavor Flays, the Flavors of Love. And um, maybe some something else may be a little bit negative um, about black people. But when it comes to like an, another population, you see friends. Almost everybody around the world knows about friends. OK, they get a more um, a more varied, I guess, like picture of another group. Whereas for us, they may only show like and if they do show like rap or hip hop it's going to be the more negative side of it, you know, um, not like the positive, um, uh, I guess, like artists who have positive lyrics and things like that. So therefore, they give them an image in their mind of what, of who, of who we are, um, and just not like, just there's not like a, I guess, like an understanding. And you also have to remember some of these places are monolithic societies, so they're like places where there's only like one group of people that generally almost generally look, look alike. Um, so when someone like us comes there, who's like totally different as, as opposed to someone who may have the same you know, skin or similar hair, um, it's going to be um, quite different. And then they may also question again, like when it comes to media, what do they see? Again, friends is like number one in some place and they may not get some of them may not even get that much media uh, with black people. And so a lot of them, they may even think that there are no black people in Western countries. And <laughs> they, they actually think that. So they're surprised and they may question, you know, um, or where are you from? No, where, where were you born? I mean, no, uh, where are your parents from? And <laughs> I even got to where they went down to the grandparents. Uh, where are your grandparents? <laughs> your grandparents from? So. <laughs> Okay, so I wanted to ask regarding your natural hair journey. Why did you start going natural? What was that reason? Yes, um, I think it probably started when I was in uh, university. I had started thinking about going natural because I had a perm. I got a perm when I was in, uh, I think, sixth grade. And... Um, my hair had also gotten like really long and everything. Everybody loved my hair, even when I was, you know, little with the perm or when it was, you know, natural, 
not blow it would blow up when I was a little girl. Um the humidity. But in university I just started thinking, like, what is my natural hair like? And um I didn't really say it to anyone. Uh, but people would say, don't, don't ever cut your hair. So when I went to uh, graduate school, I was away from everybody that I knew. So that was the first time I had been somewhere where there was nobody that I knew beforehand. Um, and so at that at that time, I made a decision uh, while I was while I was there. I can't remember if it was like during the first year or going into the the next year, but I decided that. I just didn't want the chemicals anymore. I mean, because they were damaging. Uh, even if you go to professionals, like I went to several professionals, and sometimes they damage you with the the chemicals. So uh, that's when I started when I was in graduate school to go to go natural. But even the hairstylist did not want to um, do it because she was like, my hair was very long, uh, almost like to my back, only because of the. Uh, the chemical would straighten it. And she was like, I could do so many things with your hair. And so I wore braids though, um, cause I didn't want uh, people to know what I was planning to do. So I wanted to grow out some before I like cut it. And um, eventually it came a point, I could not wear those braids as long as she, <laughs> as long as she said, I was like, how can you wear these for, you know, six months? And I, I think around like, uh, I don't know if it was like the third month, second or third month. I said, <laughs> I gotta take these out, okay? And she did, and it had grown like <laughs> it had grown some. And um, I, I, I guess because of the culture or what we used to, like actually, when I even though I went natural, uh, I ha had her to like press it, uh, press it out, but then again, she also did not know how to really uh, work with natural hair so that was right. the thing that, that she could do and so after that i was trying to like flat iron it and i didn't realize you could damage your hair like if you do that every day yes. <laughs> until i got a book to read but that was like when i started to go yeah to go natural and i'm not sure if you want me to go into reactions of people or not so i wouldn't mind you telling me what your family thought of you going natural did you get support from your family? Oh yes, that was that was so much fun. Because remember, I was away in graduate school. I was like about sixteen hours away from like my immediate family, my cousin. I think it was eight, eight closest cousin away, and so um, when they finally like got a chance to see it, I think it was my. Um, well, they saw me with the braids, so they didn't know what was really up. And I was like, oh, braids, because that was my first time ever wearing the braids. And so after I actually um, got them out and had the the perm hair cut off, I that was at a time, and I forgot. I had um, said, okay, send my little brother up to uh, visit me. And so my <laughs> little brother was on the phone with my mom, so no one back home had no one knew and so i was in the shower and i came out after washing my hair and then all of a sudden my little brother looked up at me and he said oh he said my hair is longer yes and my mother was on the phone and so she was like what what are you talking about <laughs> so that was when they first began to um learn about my hair and then i eventually went home and um yeah just for them to see it like that they were like you know well because there weren't that many people in my family who had um natural hair if i can even think of you know as far as like the women the women go but i remember one of my nephews um my nephew as well he was i was at their house because i went to um my sister's house and it was their first time seeing my hair and we were playing a video game but all of a sudden i noticed that it was quiet and <laughs> <laughs> and he was he was behind me and I I just I knew what was going on so I turned around and I knew it. He was standing up behind me just looking at my hair like cuz I had it up in the afro puff. Um right. but I, I looked at, yes, I looked at I knew that people um you know weren't so used to it. And so I made I'm always making fun of things and so even myself and so when I looked at him, I said I know 
it looks like a like a hat or a tam, like the the tam hat. And so um, that's where I usually go to the fun part. <laughs> but for um, for a while, it took a while for people to really kind of accept my hair. Um, I think my one of my grandmothers was accepting. She's always accepting of everything, but she was she would say certain things like she would call my little. Uh, my little hairs when it would pop off when I was, you know, washing or blow drying. She was like, "Your little," she said, so "little bees are <laughs> little bees or itty bees are like like there, uh, you know, like on the floor or something like that." So, because uh, her hair is quite different from our hair, she had like more a uh, straight or wavy, uh, wavy hair. So, <laughs> okay, so how did that make you feel, though? when people would respond in a shocked way, especially people within the black community. Does it show how ignorant we are on our own hair? Exactly. Um, very, very ignorant. And I think pe some people may take that as like, a, um, I guess like a, I don't know something bad if you say if you say they're ignorant, but they don't realize ignorant just means you don't know something. Exactly, um, really lack of knowledge. Yes, exactly, and so um, I know that's what that's what it's from because basically people uh, people don't understand history, people don't understand media, people don't understand uh, uh, agendas and how things come about. You know, when people want to dictate rule and all these kind of things and all those things come into play. And one of the things that it affected or impacted for us was our hair. And it is not only um, not only for us as well, but it's a kind of as far as like the beauty standards um, and with media it's something that's across the board around the world that I see. Um, whether, you know, we're black or, you know, from Jordan or somewhere else, people are put, have this standard of like, they want to get their hair, you know, as, um, as straight as possible. Cause even in China, not everybody truly has like that straight hair that you see, they go to the salon. Many of them go to the salon to get that done and their hair may freeze up. I mean, it won't be so curly like ours, but if they don't go to the salon, it won't be like that bone straight. Um, appearance that we usually get. But yes, a lot of people, especially in our community, they don't understand like the history and why that people began to do that to be accepted. And because nobody is being taught about it and they don't understand and they just see the media, they, again, are kind of, I guess, taught to believe, just like in other cultures, that this is the standard. If you don't have straight or long straight hair, then your hair is not beautiful. So you must get to that point. And I think it's also taught. We kind of like teach this um, to each other in a way that we interact and in certain standards. For instance, when I told you, um, and those are just two negative in, um, instances out of the many, many positive instances that I had of like working with recruiters abroad. Because when I went to Korea, the um, actual recruiting agency I went with was a Korean. Uh, and he had no problem like with my hair or with me. He had, didn't really have anything um, negative to say. However, when it comes to like our, our people as well, I remember going back to the USA and you know working a job african-americans and so this when i say we're starting to kind of uphold the same standard where you may have african-americans or, or black people that will tell you your hair is not acceptable and if you want to be able to succeed and be accepted in the whether it's corporate environment or to be just be successful period working there they may tell you you can't wear your hair a certain you know a certain way i was in a instance you know where that happened um for me okay my hair is natural but they deem my hair to be acceptable because they said oh you do things with your hair you style your hair your hair is okay but the other person's hair was not deemed to them acceptable and i don't know if it comes from also like some some shame um and i have nothing um against people if they want to wear weaves or even if they want to straighten you know straighten their hair 
um, with chemicals, you know, if they choose that route, uh, those type of things. But um, to, I guess, look at someone else and, you know, say this is not OK and you have to change yourself in order just to be accepted by someone someone else. I don't think that's OK. If they want to change it for themselves, then let them, you know, let them do it. But not to force and say, OK, you have to not be yourself, even though you want to wear your natural hair and conform to this, you know. OK, so what advice would you give now to women who have natural hair and want to remain professional, but they're getting a pressure saying that their natural hair in its natural state doesn't look professional enough? What would you say to those women? Um, I would say be yourself, <laughs> but that's but that's me. And I've um, been able to, you know, be myself. Um, since I wore my hair, despite, again, you mentioned uh, people not supporting you, because, again, the majority of family and even uh, people that I knew when I first uh, went natural, were kind of like, ah, ah. some of them were like, it looks good on you, but they couldn't do it. Um, but there were a lot of, you know, family that were not supportive in the beginning, but now they are. And I think if you stand in, if you're comfortable in, like, who, and who you are, whether it's for the work environment or outside, that eventually people will, you know what? They may not do it themselves, but they'll respect you. They'll look and they'll be like, you know, respect, respect her, you know, um, for that. Because they see that you are, you're, you're being who, who you are, true to who you are. And many times they wish that they could, but it's because of this, um, this false idea of things that people have and their fear. Most of it is fear. Most things are motivated by that. Their fear of what's going to happen because they don't know what's going to happen. So they stay, they box themselves in and say, okay, I have to stay within this confine. Um, whether it's how, you know, how they look or whatever, and, and they don't want to let it go. So I would still say, be yourself. You make it instances where people won't accept you um, and they won't be supportive, but at least you're being yourself because I think you're like unhappy if you're doing something just for some someone else or to fit into like some, I don't know, association, organization, you know, if you can't like be if you're true to yourself because I don't think you would be happy. All right. Okay. So thanks for those that advice. Another question I want to ask is what products do you use in your hair? <laughs> yes, um, I've used several over over time. When I first started, I would um, I would get the products that they had in the stores until I realized that many of those those um, products actually had chemicals in them. I also had a book, like when I first uh, went natural, uh, that I found about natural hair because I wanted to know how do I take care of it um, about styling. That's when I found out that putting too much heat on your hair. Uh, especially if you're doing um, the flat iron like every day could actually damage, you could still damage your natural hair. Like, and I was like, oh my goodness, I didn't know. By that time I had already damaged parts. I was like, oh no, it won't go back. So um, um, I was using some other chemicals like in the store, although they may say they're for natural hair, you have to look at the ingredients because they may still have those chemicals in it like sulfates um, and those other things that are not good for us. So I've learned to look at chemicals. And so, uh, of course, of, um, over the years, too, and prior to me, I think, like, um, going natural as well, I started thinking about um, health. And so I looked for uh, products that have as few chemicals as possible. Usually, if you cannot pronounce it, you don't know what it is, it looks scientific, then <laughs> it, it may not be good for you, but you can look it up. You can look it up, though. You can um, look in the dictionary to see what, what it means. Um, and so I try to find things that are uh, more natural. And another clue that I found since I started traveling, because I've gone to places, again, like you mentioned, Saudi Arabia, and I found that there are products because the weather was dry in certain places that wouldn't work like for my skin. And so when it came to, I would take the same idea from the things I would use on my skin, like for my hair, and I realized like in Saudi Arabia, nothing was working. I tried oatmeal baths and everything. And then I looked up and I and it said glycerin. 
glycerin um, is good for good for your skin. I found out that glycerin is a product that's in um, or it's an ingredient in most products, most beauty products. So I bought the glycerin and it worked on my skin. So actually, I use a <laughs> I use a little bit of glycerin and um, some other things. I try to take the natural products that I see. If the if the if you see an oil in a beauty supply store and it says olive oil, it's probably not olive oil, okay? Um, you can tell by the color, <laughs> but you can buy the real olive oil. You can buy right, the actual right. blue. The, the cold the pressed blue. olive oil or one hundred percent pure olive oil. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I started thinking about the healthy the healthy ingredients that they may um, put on the front of those particular products and say, hey, why can't we just take those healthy ingredients and put them together and use them ourselves, you know, by themselves or create our own products. So a lot of times that's what what I do. I create my own uh, products or mix, you know, just kind of mix things together. OK. All right. So you do you make your own products. Is there a reason why you make your own products? I mentioned to you before that I saw um, this news report that there were very harmful chemicals in um, natural hair products. So I want to know if that was the reason why you started going natural, uh, as in making your own natural products, or even thinking about using organic products. Is that the reason? Yes, yes. So that that is uh, one of the main reasons why I started looking into it. And um, again, like I said, I had um, thought about, had been thinking about health before then. So even like as far as like diet and things like that, looking at things that are harmful for us. Because um, again, not only did I want to see my the natural texture of my hair, like I mentioned, I knew that uh, perms were uh, damaging uh, to us, and I. Um, I knew people who worked in the medical industry industry or had our new people that worked in the medical industry and they had said, you know, the doctors and others themselves were like, this is harmful, like the effects it can um, cause on you. So um, like the perm, the perm has the lie in it. And so looking at those ingredients, like you said, many of them that are marketed to us, even if there's even if they say that they're um, black hair care or um, natural hair care products, many of them have still have those harmful chemicals in them. So I you know, want to stay away from those because, you know, that's absorbed into your um, into your skin. Your skin is your largest organ. You have skin under here. So it's taking it in, you know, through the skin on your scalp, your hair is, you know, taking it in. And so you just have to kind of watch those ingredients just because it says it's for natural, um, natural hair, black hair, um, doesn't doesn't mean that it's good for you. And you have to watch out. They'll put like the things, aloe vera. Like aloe vera is like the last ingredient. <laughs> no matter what, before that, you got all kinds of other stuff that's harmful for you. So... Um, and when you look at the ingredient labels, what you should look at is what's listed for first, because that's what um, they listed. Usually it's supposed to be listed in the order of whatever ingredient is the most um, in that product. So if it says aloe vera, but aloe vera is like the 23rd ingredient. <laughs> By the way, if it has 23, 40 some ingredients, probably not good. <laughs> it shouldn't be more than, say, five to six ingredients for me. If it's more than that, then it's just a bunch of chemicals. All right. So what advice would you give to women with natural hair who are dating foreigners or people of other races? Yes, because um, they're, pro they're probably curious about your hair. They have no clue until... <laughs> they have no clue until they see you like doing, you know, doing your hair. And so, um, although I don't know a little bit more than say Asian men. Um, I'm, I guess it, it depends on, I think it depends on if they have actually had contact with, uh, with black people. Cause I've been in occasions where people like, you know, I see black people too. He's always like in America. Oh my goodness. So, um, I have a black, but they have no clue about the experience 
of um, black people. Therefore, they wouldn't have a clue about um, the hair um, as, as well. But yeah, if you are, then you may want to um, tell them about it. Kind of like how I did before I went to Korea and most other jobs that I got abroad. Um, when I was sending my information and usually they want pictures. So when you ask about discrimination, when I say that sometimes people may not actually know, it's because abroad, when they ask for pictures, they look at and if they don't want, they just don't contact you. So, um, <laughs> so that's how people wouldn't know necessarily about the um, discrimination. But um, yeah, just kind of show them a little bit about it. Tell them, okay, this is what my hair may look you know, may look like. So I was sending a picture of me with a Afro and then a picture of how, like I have it now. It's like, it's like back and they couldn't tell if it's natural or like permed or whatever, but I wouldn't want them to, to be surprised. And like when I get there and if I wore my hair out in the Afro or the Afro puff and they only saw the picture of me with my hair back and then they were all caught off guard and then that's when the negativity would come out. So I wanted them to know beforehand, look, if you <laughs> if you do want me here, then this is what this is what it could be. OK, <laughs> so I knew that if they contacted me and they wanted me to work for them, that they knew because they saw the picture. So there was no problem. with it. So that's what you may want to do with your um, significant other too. <laughs> you know, kind of prepare them like, hey. Because if, if your hair is like this and then one day you come out of the bathroom and then it's all like this, like a helmet, that's how I describe my hair when it's, when it's wet. When I watch, it's like, oh, it's like a helmet. Like, so, and they're like, whoa. <laughs> then, yes. Okay, so, so let, let I, I use um, that women and men can, um, they can educate their significant other if they are of another race. Um, about their hair, about natural hair, how to take care of natural hair. The more educated they are, the more informed they are, is the less they will react <laughs> in a certain way. You understand? And sometimes the reaction can be a bit offensive. So it's yeah. better to educate and inform them. All right, so what about uh, people that have children, whether they are full kinky, wavy hair or biracial with curly hair, what advice would you give to people who are traveling, who've lived abroad or who are abroad right now, maybe in Asia, in Europe, in Latin America, South America, and they have children with natural hair? Um, definitely, um, if, if they're abroad, I think that they understand um, uh, if they're abroad now, I think they probably understand about people um, in those other countries. But if you're if they're not abroad already, or even if they are abroad, they they may be new there or having a hard time dealing with things that are going on. But one of the things I mentioned before um, is the monolithic societies. So you definitely want to make sure that you do the research before you go to a place because if you're going to like a monolithic society again, this is where people. Um, it's pretty much like the same group of people. They all look alike. There's not much there. Well, not that they look alike, look alike, but there's not much var variation where they're all basically the same, similar color, not too far off uh, as far as like color wise. There's less like variation. So when you see someone coming in that's like dark skin and has hair that's like, you know, curly and it's not just basically not like theirs, you're going to have instances where people are going to. Because uh, they're going to think it's strange. They're going to think it's weird. Just like if we were somewhere and not everybody believes in aliens, but let's say an angel. Most people believe in angels. Like an angel just like flies down and you, you what are you going to do? You're going to look and you're going to be like, oh my goodness, you're not just going to walk past, you know, you know, like the angel unless you're used to, <laughs> used to seeing them. So it's just like us. When we go into a place and there's no one there that looks like us and they've never seen anyone in person um, like us, they're like curious, like the alien, the angel came down. So <laughs> like, oh my goodness. And, but many times it can, it can be confused as being rude. And that kind of, that's like a cultural thing too, where, where you're from, people have different things in culture, like personal space and everything. And so they may see it as people like staring, like that's rude, but they're, they're, 
maybe genuinely like curious. And many times when you find when you find out later, what I found is that people have their when they see it because it is different in many cases. They're like in awe, and they're actually like, "Oh my goodness!" Because they've never seen it before. And they're like, "Oh, beautiful, uh, fashionable." So for I think for the kids. For them, not um, they're not like adults where they can process things, so that the kids are not uh, damaged by that. Learn about that place and explain it to them beforehand, and let them know. Okay, the people um, are looking at you because you're you're special. Because basically, that's what it turns into. Not that you're just weird. Yeah, it's kind of weird because it's strange, but because you're also special. There's no one like you. Who's like this here? So when when they're looking, it's special so that they don't have like a, a negative, I guess, like um, reaction or like memories about it and think that they're they're so bad. And just because the people don't understand uh, in, in that particular place does and the people may not look like them in that place so that they don't feel bad about themselves. Their self esteem doesn't go down. Um, you have to make sure that they're like uh, they have self confidence. In themselves, that being different doesn't mean that you're you're bad, and you don't have to try to like you know fit in and to just love themselves, uh, to like themselves. So I think that would be important before you go to a place. Make sure you do again the research. Where uh, this is the other thing too. I think if you um, go down to like, like some maybe South America, Latin American places, it'll be totally different. So that's why I said, <laughs> why I said do the research of where you're going if you're going to. Yeah, you if you go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I couldn't, I couldn't hear. Um, there, there's also like opposites. Whereas we look at, okay, well, we're we're black. Like I was in Peru, and um, a young guy uh, that was there, he was from America. He was there to study TEFL, and he was white. You know, white from America, but he confided in me one day. He just got angry, upset. We were walking because he said that he said, Oh my goodness, I'm tired. He said, These people looking at me like I'm an alien. And it's because he was white, and most of the people there are like um, a tan, a brown skin. But for him and another guy who was also white, uh, he was very, very tall, like about, I think, six feet or taller. So he said he always got that. Um, that look from people, and it's, I think uh, some men, he said, even were um, afraid, like they thought he was dangerous, because <laughs> the people there are generally very short. So any this this is just my example of just being different. It's at the opposite end, they were, you know, Caucasian or white, and they're in a monolithic society where most people are like, you know, a little bit tan um, there, and they were looked at like the angel or the alien that came down. So they had this, you know, it's a somewhat similar experience, um, but make sure definitely for the kids that you prepare them. If you're taking kids with you, like <laughs> make sure you do the research. I tell adults to do it, but especially for kids because um, things can be more lasting, you know, and kids from their experiences when, when they're younger. So make sure you do the research and prepare them and make sure that they're um, confident before they go to a place, explain those things to them. Okay, and I always say to teachers, uh, if you're packing your family and you're going all the way to another country in another continent, you have to ensure that your confidence level is at a certain point where nobody else can tell you anything that you don't know of yourself. Do you understand? So you have yes. to know, okay, you, if you have natural hair, if you have dark skin, white skin, whatever shape you are or whatever color you are, it does not matter. You, you are confident in who you are. You know who you are. And therefore, the stares that may come will not phase you. It, it may make you a little nervous sometimes, but it won't phase you. And it would cause you to feel bad about yourself in any way because you're already confident. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I want you to tell me a little bit about your TEFL experience. You've been traveling around the world and you do mostly online teaching right now. So tell me more about um, your TEFL job and how you got into teaching English um, as a, you know, in this industry. Uh, yes, actually, I started, um, 
when I was back in the USA um, and I worked in uh, special education, um, started as, uh, actually I was a mental health therapist before, <laughs> before I got into the teaching part, but in a school because I wanted to work in the um, school environment. Yes, I was studying um, to be a psychologist uh, at one point. So like <laughs> a clinical psychologist. <laughs> um, so I, I had the idea that I wanted to change things in the educational environment. Um, and actually, if I take it back to when I was little, um, it'll probably give an understanding of how I got to uh, where I am. When I was little, um, I wanted to be a teacher. I really did. I used to play teacher. I used to make my cousins, my sister, anything I could, if I couldn't get people, my friends, <laughs> I would get my dolls and uh, other things would be my school subject. And so um, I really wanted to be a teacher until um, third grade. In third grade, one of my teachers um, who, she loved me. I know, she, I knew that she did. Um, she had had my brother before. And because she she said at one time she wished she had a whole classroom full of me. <laughs> but at that time, I was like, oh, my goodness, no. <laughs> it wouldn't talk. It would be so quiet. And <laughs> um, one day she asked a question that most teachers ask little kids. What do you want to be when you grow up? And so I said, I, I want to be a teacher. And then all of a sudden her facial expression changed. But. Not the expression I was expecting. She said, no. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my goodness, what did I do? I was the only person in the class she did that to. And um, I thought I did something bad. But then she explained to me, even though she was a white, a white teacher, but I, that had nothing to do with it. Some people may think, oh, that was racist. She was, no. She told me after she said the no, I mean, this was a stern no for a third grader. Uh, she told me, she said, teachers, she was talking about from her experience. She said teachers don't make enough. And she said they have too much. They have too much work. They're, they're working a lot. And she told me, she said, but she prefaced that by saying, you can be anything you want to be. You can be a doctor, lawyer, scientist like this. And um, so I see where she was coming from, especially after I became a teacher. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, what are you? I mean, the teachers teach the doctors and the, the NBA players. Why are they getting paid like this? So, um, but from that moment when she said that, because I respected her so much and I loved her too, guess what? That's why I was saying it's so important things that you um, say um, say to kids or do. It went out of my mind. I put it out of my mind. She said, don't be a teacher. So from that point on, I never thought about being a teacher again. Although along the way, people would say that, you know, to me, even when I went to university, uh, because I had determined I was going to, you know, study psychology um, after the shootings that happened in America, the first mass school shooting, and because I wanted to be a medical doctor before then. I was thinking about that. That was one of the things. And then I said, hey, you know what? Even if I treat the patients like on the outside, on the inside, they have other things going on. If they come in, they have like some kind of bruise, but it was from domestic violence, then yeah, I helped the bruise, but not what's like going on. So that's where I decided I want to get into psychology. And again, like the first mass school shooting, I knew exactly why it happened um, because of bullying. And so that's why I went and decided to go into um, psychology. So um, even in undergrad, there were professors there. Like one, he wasn't even one of my professors, but he was in a department that I was in for my minor telecommunication. He said, you know, you should be a teacher. And <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not going to be a teacher. So it was still in my mind, like, no, I'm not going to be a teacher, but I want to work in the education system to change things in um, in the environment. And so I went to grad school for clinical psychology with the mindset, I'm going to become a clinical psychologist to learn how to create programs and things to change things within um, the educational school environment, which caused like that whole, you know, the bullying, the act that happened like after that. And so um, while I was <laughs> while I was there, at a point, I, I worked in a practicum in um, in a um, middle school, uh, working with boys, giving them mental health therapy and special education. Um, but when I got ready to leave uh, the program, the one the person who really wanted me in the program, I, I wanted to talk to her because I think she was the assistant or associate dean. And she was, she told me a story. I was like, 
was she telling me this? But she told me about another young lady who was in the same program, but she left some years before. And she left and ended up, I think, in Alaska as an English teacher. And I'm like, why she, why she telling me this? Like, I still was not thinking about being a teacher, um, even though someone from my under, undergrad university, he said, hey, why don't you come back and get in the education program to be a teacher? It's like, I'm not going to be a teacher. I'm not going to be a teacher. So um, I worked in the mental health field uh, for a while. And then just one day it was just like, Oh, be a teacher. <laughs> like, wait a minute. So I went on my journey. That's when I started as a teacher in special education. But I also remembered um, my dream of traveling the world. So I began to look at opportunities for teaching English. However, at my school, which was a special school uh, for kids who had behavioral um, and emotional issues, it was hard for them to get people that could really like stay in that stay in the environment who knew how to do it because most people would come in if they're not used to that type of environment because kids could get violent and this is like on a daily basis you get hurt and things like that um they would leave so whenever they got people that they knew understood like the environment they would want to keep you there so when i would look at the programs because they had exchange programs for teachers and i would think about Maybe I could do this. And I was like, they'll never do this in my school. So I kind of put it out of my mind. But after I had ended um, teaching there, uh, two of my classmates from my master's program said to me, hey, you're an English teacher. And then I thought, I was like, you know what, I can. So that's when the um, teaching abroad, you know, I began to take shape and I got into a TEFL um, program to get certified. And then I was on my way. Um, of which teaching abroad, so that's how. Which was which program was your first program that you left the states on? Um, well, I actually just got um, a job, so pretty much I haven't gone through like any programs. Uh, all the jobs that I've gotten have been independent, so I just used a recruiter uh, for for most of them. I think I used a recruiter, so I just uh, went to work at a school um, in Korea in um, Kyungido province. Uh, so it wasn't necessarily like a, I went in like as a program, it wasn't something like that, just kind of like looking for a job. And now you're teaching <laughs> English online. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, yes, now that I'm teaching online and I think teaching in the classroom has, uh, <laughs> has helped. <laughs> Uh, help with that, giving me the experience. And of course, my psychology background as well. I did not realize, but when I started teaching online, I, I knew it was something I wanted to offer like in my business, but my initial focus was I wanted to focus on helping other people get abroad. That's mainly what I wanted to start, start off with. And one of my friends uh, who I met while teaching abroad, she was from South Africa, um, uh, my friend's daughter, she was so sweet, she uh, passed away though. But in the beginning, um, when I was talking about my business, she said, Hey, have you, um, she said, thought about teaching online? I didn't do it like right away when she mentioned it because that wasn't my focus. But later on, like, um, a series of events happened, and then I was like, Okay, let me <laughs> go, uh, start teaching, uh, teaching online. So one of the things I didn't know when I started that, because I was like, well, hey, let me just go, let me start this. But I didn't realize um, how many people I would be able to reach. And not only that, but the, the impact. So in my mindset, I'm going to teach English, but there's been so many other things I've helped people with. I mean, sometimes they may think they're calling for English. And like we talked about the self-esteem, self-confidence, and that has a lot to do with their, um, many of them learning English as well. But I've been able to do that on a more personal level, whereas in my classrooms, you don't, I've been, I was able to do that with um, students, but because you have so many other things to do and so many things you have to teach them, you can't do that with every person. But when I'm teaching online, most of the time it's individual. And I've had people to call that have, I mean, like, <laughs> oh my goodness, I was about to cry. Um, in some situations where, you know, it's um, uh, frantic. I've had people, and like you, you mentioned, you saw my profile on one of the sites and they, they, they see that. And sometimes people just want to, 
they want happiness. Sometimes it is just you, you, when it comes down to it, it's happiness. I've had people who've been suicidal. They've been on there and they're like, you know, I want to kill myself. And I'm like, why are you going to kill so yourself? Like, like a classroom is a, a therapy room and you are the therapist and you're speaking to the yes. students. And so it's yes. more than teaching English. It's actually helping your students. And that's why I named my company Happy Teachers. It's to pull the students to us because they can see where this is a happy place and we're here to give joy. Um, so I do understand everything that you're saying. And sometimes it can be a bit heartbreaking, but it makes you feel good when you talk to a student and you've encouraged them and they leave your classroom feeling better about themselves. Yes. So thanks, Tawanda. Um, I wanted to ask you specifically what your, um, what your niche is with teaching English. Uh, do you just teach general English or do you have a, um, like, a, do you teach English for specific purposes like business or medical English or English for psychologists? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of English do you teach? Uh, generally, I prefer a conversation, which is what I realized, you know, when I was teaching uh, along the way that I've been teaching English abroad, I prefer like the conversation. I think more students need um, help in that regard. So that's what I prefer. But because I'm teaching on different platforms um, and sometimes students call with different needs. So I do end up helping them, like you said, I've had some psychologists <laughs> the call or um, those who need help with their writing. But what I focus on generally is um, English conversation. So that's what I, I prefer to do. But I've also taught children. They need to know like phonics or sounds. I've taught some of everything, but I prefer English conversation. Okay, great. All right. So guys, this is it for Tawanda. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. We haven't gotten any that everybody knew what we were talking about and no one had any questions. If you have, or if you look at this video after the fact, you can always put your questions in the comments and we'll get back to you. But in the meantime, follow Tawanda on all of the social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Tawanda Basin. And uh, you can follow me at I am Renice Irving. You can also follow Happy Teachers at Happy Teachers JA on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you guys for tuning in. It was a pleasure sharing information with you. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us on social media. And we'll see you again next time for another video. Take care. Bye-bye.